need some sort of geographic place where people can meet. You need a shared passion, a shared interest, and then you have to have visionary individuals. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello, and today I've got Dr. Zavia Karner on the show with me. Zavia, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here, Chris. It's great to have you here. I know we got a chance to connect through a mutual friend who introduced us and you have quite an impressive background and a lot of accomplishments under your belt. And I know you said you've been grading papers all day, so you're excited to do something else for a little bit. I'm sure, exactly. I'm sure you love it, but it's like a love-hate relationship, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I read your bio and you have an impressive background, but I'd love for you to go ahead and introduce yourself so the audience can get a good idea of who is Zavia. Oh. <laughs> it's like a major question that you, if you want. No. Um, yes, I am a professor uh, on the faculty at the University of Houston. I teach sociology. I have been there oh, for a long time. We'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, I'm also the chair of the department now, so I do a lot of administrative things besides grading papers. Um, I mostly uh, teach sociology of culture, sociology of art, and visual sociology. Awesome. Most, awesome. most of my interests are in the visual realm, which yes. we'll probably talk about. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we could absolutely dive into that. So I know we when we talked last time, you said you had traveled to how how many countries you had moved so many times by the time you were 18, and that played a big role in ah, uh, yes. I think I was a sociologist before I knew what sociology <laughs> was in a way, because my father was a, an aerospace engineer. And so his company would kind of move us around. I used to joke we'd move every few years, whether we needed to or not, but it was really <laughs> employment driven. Um, and so I did sit down when I was about 18 and count how many places we'd actually lived. And it was right around 20, 21 places. Wow. Some for as short as three months, but others for as long as two years. So by the time I was 18, I'd never lived any place longer than two years. Wow. I went to four different high schools. So I kind of had a transient upbringing. And I think that why I say I was a sociologist before I knew it is because you're always the new kid, you know? So you're always looking at this community from the outside, like, who am I gonna be friends with? Who are the cool kids? Who are the bullies, you know? And how do I wanna orient into this community? So I guess I was analytical from the, beginning and would just kind of observe and study and then plan my strategy. For yes, <laughs> that's very interesting. And I guess it's so different than being in the same school forever. I remember, I mean, I went to pre-K through eighth grade at the same Catholic school in Sugarland. I went to St. Lawrence, if you're familiar with that. It's, oh, but, it's a Sugarland wow. school because, you know, we're, we're both, you know, Houstonians, Houstonians I, I now live in Colorado, yeah. but but when I went there, it was just literally, I knew people from kindergarten who were with me in eighth grade. And, you know, you had your circles, you know, for the most part, who's who. And occasionally there'd be that new person who transferred in in sixth grade. And you're like, oh, who's that outsider, right? <laughs> yeah, We've been exactly. here from the start. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a chance to learn how to plug in and quickly analyze where the different groups, the the bullies versus the the nerds versus <laughs> yeah, exactly. the book club, right? <laughs> the yeah. book tours. Well, and it was also interesting because you learned that wherever you are at that moment, it's not always going to be like that. And that there was adventure around the corner, you know, that each place would be a little different geography, climate. We lived in North Dakota for a while, which was, I'll leave it at cold, yeah. <laughs> but it was an adventure in a different kind of way in terms of just climate. So I think, you know, that was kind of, so, you know, that even if it's really wonderful, it may not be wonderful much longer. Um, and if it's really miserable, you're just gonna move pretty soon and you get to start over. And yeah. so almost every move, you had the opportunity to kind of reinvent who you were, which is a little interesting too. That's um, Yeah, so I remember we had one move and my brother who is five years younger than me, um, decided he didn't like his first name. So he, when we moved, it's like, okay, we're going to call Kurt David now, you know, and <laughs> we did. And everybody accepted. It was like, wow, that's so cool. You could, 
That's you know, so cool. it was kind of fun. I don't even know what prompted him to want to do that. I just know we did. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's an so important it shows lesson. how permeable, you know, the culture is. It's kind of, you know, your presentation of self is to some extent. That's oh, that, that's so important because a lot of times we get stuck in our past selves and who others think we are. And I mean, I just recently got married as I think we had spoken about when we initially connected and my best man has been a friend since third grade. And he gave his little speech and was saying, you know, Chris is the same Chris that I've always known. And in my mind, I was par partially like, not really. I've grown a lot. <laughs> I've, I'm totally different. I have this podcast, all these different things. I could appreciate the message, but I also, part of me was saying, in my mind, like, no, I'm definitely not at all the same person that you met when we were in third grade, right? Because we do change. But yes. I think the problem is if you've been in the same school, you've been in the same town forever, and you never really learned that lessons, it's easy to have the past hold you back because you think, oh, I've never been wealthy. I've never been a cool kid. I've never been in shape. You let the past define your future. And we don't, we don't realize how easily we can actually change things or reinvent ourselves at any time. And that's easier to do in my opinion, or at least from my experience moving to Colorado, I could have changed my name too. I don't want to be Chris anymore. I want to be Joe or something, right? No one here knows me. I can reinvent myself and recreate myself. So that's a very exactly. neat uh, lesson that you were able to learn just from yeah. your own experience. Well, and I think comparing my experience to yours, it shows how important context is. Yeah. Because if you're in the same context, it's almost like the context, the people around you kind of trap you in that previous identity too. They don't give yes. you as much space to grow and change. Because they just see you as they knew you. Same thing if you knew someone and you hadn't seen them in 10 years, they their memory of you now, or at least their assumption is that you were that same person that they knew 10 years ago. And really mm -hmm. things are completely different. You've had a whole bunch of new experiences and knowledge and lessons and learnings. Yeah, exactly. So I guess the lesson is if you want to change, it's easier if you change your context first, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a powerful lesson. But I know that we were going to talk as, a lot about community as well, because you've had to plug in and kind of be that chameleon of, geez, I'm in a new place in four high schools. <laughs> That's a lot of different high schools. <laughs> so how did you do it? Did you develop a strategy for let me scope things out and who am I going to talk to and how am I going to navigate this? I think I did at some level intuitively do that, you know, because I was always very observational, you know, I wanted to get the lay of the land and, and I'm still like that with work. I want the big picture and then I can work on the little things, you know, mm -hmm. and then I can come up with my strategy. And I think that was part of that is just learning to kind of observe and you learn where to observe too. So like the lunchroom was really important and that's yeah. how you could see the hierarchy really quick. Not so much in the classroom, you know? And so, yeah, just little things like that that you just pick up as you do it over and over and over again, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. It, yeah. It's hard sometimes too though, right? We, we tend to judge a book by its cover. We may make quick assumptions of how we think someone is when really that's too surface level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that comes with maturity because when you're a kid, you're pretty much into the social norms and, yeah. you know, you haven't, you haven't learned that, you know, people can be really wonderful, but maybe look different than you yeah. were thinking originally, you know, so you, you have to get past that a little bit, but that honestly for myself did not happen until I started to study sociology and got a little bit more aware um, before that it was all pretty much intuitive. And I would say the, the other part of community that I didn't know I was going to be so good at, which is really odd to say, sorry, it's a little bright. <laughs> you can own but, it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I went through college, you know, and did that, did grad school and did a PhD about something completely different. But my first job was to um, manage a demonstration grant for the government. So it was a federal demonstration grant where they were trying to introduce more services, respite services, doesn't really matter what kind, but services into non-traditional populations. So people of color or people that lived in rural counties mm -hmm. that hadn't had these services. So you have these mainstream service providers in 220 sites across the US that are trying to figure out how to reach new populations, new audiences. 
And that was fascinating because it's just like being the new kid. Only I got to watch all these people, you know, 220 sites be the new kid in this new kind of context and new approach and, and uh, learning that the approach with the middle class white population wasn't going to fly and they had mm -hmm. to learn to bend and stuff. So right. that was really fascinating because I had to get even more analytical because it was a government grant. So you actually had to do reports and document and have lots of data. And so that was fascinating to see how sometimes the same approach would work great in one community, not at all in the other community. I think it had a lot to do with leadership of the individuals and whether they could think outside their context and try to put themselves in the position of the, the people they were trying to reach and understanding that they would be different. And those who said, oh, I don't have a cultural competence in this group and hired people that did, that were wise enough to say, I'm not the expert, I need people that know more, were the ones that did much better. So the, being open to having, to not knowing everything and not being the expert all the time yeah. was um, one of the kind of key things I saw with the leadership throughout the country that made a big difference. And then there were other things, but that was my first professional uh, attempt at um, strategizing and understanding community in a broad sense was through all these different cultural kind of. Uh, That's attempts. very interesting for sure. And even just, I think back to corporate when I worked in an oil and gas company and just different departments. And then I was a young person right out of college and I'm trying to tell uh, people that could have been my parents, for example, what to do for different projects that we were implementing and they're not really wanting to listen to me because I have no idea what I'm doing and they've done that for 20 years. And how do you navigate that? And how do you, it's somewhat political, I guess, in a way, if you've got to get the person uh, who's their boss on your side to tell them what to do because they're not listening to you. And so there's a lot of um, nuances, I guess, or different variables that you have to pay attention to. And uh, it's same thing, what you just said there, finding the right people who have that influence and know how to navigate those conversations that led to more success than me just trying to figure it all out on my own, knowing mm -hmm. that I was not the expert and that I did not have the influence, right? <laughs> so you obviously had a very intuitive, good leadership skills. Yeah, I tried, I tried. <laughs> I mean, you learn, right? It's it's right. something that you pick up, I think, even with you traveling so much, you kind of pick up on those those social cues and I don't know if that person liked me or are they fake smiling or is that a genuine smile? You start to pick up on things. Mm -hmm. And if you're very, I guess, intuitive or you're paying close attention, some people have a better sense of how things are really going and being able to connect with people on that emotional level. I think that's how you get a lot more influence and get people to actually do things and make change in organizations and things like that. Yes. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The emotional intelligence is a key, key kind of um, factor to figuring out how the world works and how you can make your impact in a yeah. sense. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because gosh, mm -hmm. it is hard to get people to do things that they don't want to do. People don't like change, and they like the way things have been. And even for us, you know, we have to always think. I think of Witham Radio. What's in it for me? W I I F M. <laughs> right. <laughs> You got to try to find ways to incentivize people and say, look, right. this is a win. It's a win for both yeah. of us. This is why making this change will help us both. We'll both be more efficient and work less and make more money or whatever the thing may be, right? Whatever the benefits, the promised benefits are that you're uh -huh. trying to share. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. It's something you learn by doing wrong a few times too. I mean, it's a learn by doing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm not saying I've cracked the code at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we know how to approach it maybe a little bit more effectively every time that we do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Effectively and reflectively. I think that's Ooh. the other side of that is you have to really be open to thinking about things instead of taking them for granted. Right. Um, and I think I found that you know, teaching. So my students are perpetually 18 to 20 something, you know, so I age, but they all stay the same. <laughs> um, but it's been really interesting. And I don't know if you had this experience, Chris, but you know, you, you, 
don't realize how different people think about things until you're actually in a setting where you're talking about how people think. Yeah. And so many of my students just take um, cultural norms for granted. Like, well, of course it's like that. That's just the way it always was. Or that's my grandfather right. said, that's the way the world works, you know? And they hadn't thought farther than that, which is the true insight of sociology. <laughs> Put that in there. It's, it causes you to think beyond what you think you know, in a sense. But it's mm -hmm. always surprising to me that in this day and age with Google and podcasts and so many places to get information and a variety of points of view, if you step out of your echo chamber, of course, um, that you have such an opportunity to see a diverse viewpoint, but people don't. That's so interesting. <laughs> some do, some do. Yeah. Yes, and I think when you're in your 18, 18 to 20 range, you're, I think back to myself, right? Just I'm thinking about the weekend and, oh, I want to play some video games and there's a pool party on Sunday, right? Those, those, your priorities are totally different. And I think afterwards, it wasn't until maybe 22, 23, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but you get that first job. Okay. Let me actually pay my bills. I want to buy a house. I want to pay down that car, do the grown up thing a little bit more, right? Because yeah. oftentimes kids are in college and their parents are paying for that experience to, network and find themselves and join different clubs. And so I think they're a lot more influenceable or if that's the right word, uh, persuadable <laughs> based on what they see. Impressionable. Yeah. Impressionable. Yeah. I was like, there's a word like that. That means there what I'm is. trying to say. So thank yeah. you. They're far more impressionable <laughs> based on what they see on social media or what someone tells them. But I think afterwards you start to do more self-reflection and you're more open to different viewpoints. And you're like, well, I, I, I grew up like, for example, I went to Catholic school my whole life and I was, this is the way it is. And you're going to go to church on Sunday every single week and blah, blah, blah. This is your faith because you were born into it. And then you start to question and, oh, like, let me talk to people of different faiths. And why do you believe that? And I worked in the Middle East for six or seven months and no, nope, oh, not very, very many Catholic people out there. Right. So why do you believe what you believe? And tell me about your religion and mm -hmm. interesting time, right? Like Ramadan, mm -hmm. I was there. Everything's closed mm -hmm. for a whole month. You can't really eat in public. It's got to be behind closed walls or doors, right? A separate section. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're just like, gosh, everything I believed was true. And reality is completely flipped in this new place that I'm in. And that's the status quo here. So what else do I believe that is probably not correct or not how it is everywhere, right? Yes. And you're you're giving just another example to what we were talking about is context that opens yeah. eyes. You know, I'm I am, even though I have traveled a lot, um, a proponent of travel. I think it's the I best education there is. And I do love it. I, yeah. I own, <laughs> it is fun. It's a pleasure. Yes. Yeah. If anyone wants to pay for our next trip, please do. Like we will yeah. document it and share our findings. <laughs> Exactly. That would be cool. Find a sponsor to just send us to Europe for a month or something. I'm, oh, I'm game for that. I want a year. <laughs> I want to go and travel around the whole world and, and do the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, it's such yeah. a great way, though, to open your eyes and just it, it's fun to me to get lost in a country and not know the language. And, you know, your taxi driver is asking where you're from and you're just, you know, building up a sense of community with a complete stranger on the other side of the world who maybe barely speaks the same language as you. I think I would not be able to say that myself. As a blonde woman who travels alone at times, I can't say that the strange men in the taxi are always <laughs> an exciting moment that I was looking forward to. Perhaps but, we, we both have slightly different experiences because of that. Yes, <laughs> I blend yeah, in a little so, bit. When I lived in the Middle East, they were speaking to me in Arabic thinking that I was maybe from there, right? So, so you could blend. You could I can pass. blend in, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm from uh, from Dubai. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think um, I'm really lucky that even if we don't get a sponsor for our year of travel, oh, I that <laughs> I am, um, my I make a living by being curious. You know, to me, yeah. that's what sociology is. Whatever I'm curious about is what I can turn my research skills to. So I'm not locked into doing the same thing every day, much like you with a podcast, you get to talk to somebody new each time. Yes. You know, and that just, I just feel really lucky to have locked into that sort of a situation where I'm curious, I can, I can follow my passion. That's really yeah. cool because I think it a is. lot of us get stuck in maybe jobs or careers that you're doing the same thing. 
it's part of your resume now. So it only makes sense to stay there because you already have a couple of years of experience there and mm -hmm. even manufacturing plants, right? You're a buyer, yeah. you're in the purchasing department. Now you're a senior purchaser. Yeah. Now you're the purchasing manager and you're just there managing the ordering of parts day in, day out, yeah. sitting in two hour meetings. Review. Where's that part number? Where's this part number? Let's expedite <laughs> this, right? Right. Yeah. And it's even worse if you're really good at it. Uh, then I you know, know you get stuck. <laughs> The curse of competence. Basically. Yes, yes. Because yeah. now you're so good at it. Why would you switch to something where you're going to have to be new again and start from scratch? Yeah, it's hard to leave sunk costs alone. Yeah, it and is to something new. Yeah, it really is. But I love that about both of our careers is that we both get to do something new and really no two days are the same. And depending on the calendar invites that I send out, I may have a coffee meeting or a lunch meeting. And, or a podcast interview about meditation, for example. You really never know. I love it. I love the diversity in what I'm able to do. And it sounds like you've been able to find that for yourself as well, which is really cool. Absolutely. Because I did have one of those kind of jobs before I found <laughs> so, you know, a profession in sociology. So yes. Yeah. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm definitely happy I made the jump and the change and you know, it, it all worked out for me. Yeah. I love that. That's amazing to hear. So what, what's been some of the other lessons? I know you said you get to see 18 to 22 year olds most of the time, how oh. they're thinking about the world and reality and what kind of lessons have you drawn from, from those experiences? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is a little scary. Um, and you'll have to, we'll put this in context. So it doesn't sound so bad, but <laughs> I run the internship program. So I get the creme de la creme to work with every semester. Of the, they have to have a high GPA because I'm sending them into the community to work with, you know, so it reflects on us. But <laughs> we got to the end of a semester, not last semester, but recently, post-COVID. And we do kind of a debriefing last meeting. And we're sitting around and I'm like, so what did you learn? You know, tell me about this. And and they all agreed they didn't want to work nine to five in an office. <laughs> yeah. Guilty. That and is the I sentiment. I had to keep my teacher face on. I was like, <laughs> well, I guess that means you want to be hands on in the field, maybe, huh? You know, I try right. To try to it, give but... them a good, the benefit yeah. of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because um, not wanting to work isn't probably going to fly in this society. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it was really interesting that. You know, the norms that we took for granted, you know, when we graduated that, yeah, you're going to work 40 hours a week, you're going to have to do something. They're thinking beyond that and saying, okay, I don't want that. It's so I funny. Want, <laughs> I want podcasts. I want to, you know, do yeah. more interesting things. So that was kind of fun to see. Um, I think the other thing is that they're all very, very worried about the job market and the economy right now. Mm -hmm. you know, even though the job market is good, but um, it's hard to go out and sell yourself the first time. Um, it really so is. Yeah. They're having to do that. And I keep telling them being a student means that you can try all these things and it's not as risky as when you have a mortgage and three kids. So right. go out and take your risks now. Um, and consider this like practice run for when you really do want the job, go do the interviews, go yeah. explore, go talk to people. Um, and people open doors for students that they won't open for you when you say, I want a job, you know, so yes. take advantage of this moment. And so a lot of them do, and they've ended up in some really cool places. And so That's great advice. And I, I know that sentiment as well, because, you know, I'm actually, I'm 32 and I feel those same things. I'm working with a real estate mentor in, in Colorado and we're trying to figure out a way to work together. I'm like, look, I have these skill sets. I'm closing deals virtually. Like I know how to generate income without trading uh, time for money type thing. And he's mm -hmm. really wanting to find someone full time. And we got a little bit of an age difference. I think he's 41 or 42. So he's got 10 years on me or so. He's like, well, gosh, you, you only want to work four hours a day and get paid this much. And I'm like, man, I know how to make money without ever going to a single house. Like, I don't want to sit there and trade time for money. I've already figured out how to make money outside of that. So we literally had that conversation this morning. And I was like, I hope you can see where I'm coming from. I'm afraid of committing on this because I don't want to be stuck working eight hours a day because of the freedom, the society we live in. There's a lot of the gig economy, right? If someone wants right. to go drive Uber for four hours and then go skiing in the mountains, they can do that yeah. or be a ski bum, be a ski instructor and live in Breckenridge. Like that's an option as well. 
-hmm. where maybe it's not necessarily a career. It could be more of a season perhaps (laughs) while people find themselves. But I love the advice you're giving to people that, hey, especially when you don't have a mortgage and three kids, that's the time to go explore, experiment. You're not going to know what you like if you haven't done it before. So try multiple things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I should have you talk to my intern. <laughs> oh, I did a I did a, a career day one time and I was talking about how you guys don't need to go to college. Like, dude, this is a, oh, okay, the, no, the teachers were looking at me like, you know, I was, okay, go to call. I have my college degree. I did that. I worked in oil and gas. It's a great, you know, I was kind of backpedaling a little bit saying it's a great opportunity so that you don't have to rely on figuring out how to make commissions as a real estate professional, for example. You can fall back on that 70 or 80K a year oil and gas job like I did, right? That was a great experience and opportunity to get my foot in the door and just build up some savings and get to work in Dubai. I had some fun with all of that, right? So yeah, that would have been fascinating. But the internet's also that deadly curse in a way for all these young minds. They're seeing all these people making money doing TikTok videos and playing video games and streaming it online. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's a whole new world that we hadn't, wasn't even on the radar right 10 15 years ago so right I know (laughs) I I heard a tech person say once you know that college is we are raising or growing students for jobs that don't exist yet yeah we need to think about that we're not training people Mm. for what exists now but what they can do in the future as everything Very interesting. is changing. And yeah. we don't even know what that's going to be, right? Because I know people yeah. who had careers as like newspaper editors and, you know, that's totally different now. There's blog posts and YouTube videos and social media channels. So that's very interesting uh, takeaway. How, are there any other lessons that really stand out that you've kind of run into in your career and your experience? Uh, with students? Yeah, because that's the future. I'm just curious, what's the future yeah. of uh, of our world looking like? <laughs> they don't want to work well, nine someday, to five. I can resonate. Yeah, some days I worry <laughs> about that. Um, but other days I'm like, this is going to be great. They're all good. <laughs> um, it really, you know, it's very individualized. I think teaching in Texas, it's really, I, I came to University of Houston primarily because I was so entranced with the diversity. I came for my interview and I'm getting the tour of the campus and we're walking between one building and the next building. And I heard like five different languages spoken. And I was like, that's amazing. I can, I can be here. This will work. (laughs) Yeah. That. And I, I, my daughter bought me a book called moving to Houston and it had a section on museums and I counted, I could go to a new museum every week for a year and not have to repeat. I thought, wow, those are two really good things. I could live there. There's a quality of life. I could. Yes. Yeah. It's a huge place. And that's one thing that we're missing a little bit in Colorado in the Denver area. It's like, man, you know, I'm half Indian, half Mexican. My wife is half Korean, half Mexican. And we definitely see, we stand out a little bit more out here where we're like, gosh, there's a lot of, you know, white people that are blonde and brunette just running around. And that's cool. I mean, we have nothing against that, but being in Houston, the food, the culture, you know, you're eating authentic food, every restaurant you go to, it's like a family that came from Vietnam directly that has owned that place for 40 years. Uh, There's several restaurants like that. So yeah, good, good stuff in Houston. You picked a good spot. Yeah, I did. And, and it's been really interesting as the world kind of, you know, events happen. Mm -hmm. I often will have someone in my class from whatever that country was within like six months. Wow. because they all, you know, were a great refugee settlement um, city. So, so that adds so much to the conversation in the classroom. Again, yeah. it's almost like if you can bring people in, the people that don't get to travel kind of get some of that experience in a sense. And so, yes, yes. Um, at, you know, I probably would love that even if I wasn't a sociologist, but it just makes teaching at UH really pleasurable. That's very and, cool. And exciting and the diversity is just amazing. So yeah. And I mean, nothing can really replace, in my opinion, the actual power of traveling, but it is really cool when you get to at least talk to, you know, an exchange student who's spending the summer or one semester in Texas who came from France. I had one of those in college station. I'm like, man, what a rip off. Whoever goes to France is having a great time. You're stuck in this <laughs> tiny college town. <laughs> uh, but I'll bet that person from France helped you look at that tiny college town differently. Things yeah. that you hadn't paid attention to. Things I hadn't even checked was out. Like, how does this work? You know? Right, yeah. right. And they were, you know, appreciating that. And so there's always, you know, it's just perspective and changing your perspective and seeing something new. 
I think uh, the novelty piece is something we're all excited for. And that's probably part of the problem with all the, you know, younger generation is they can see anything they want to on social media of, oh, I can do this or I can do that. And then indecision settles in because there's so many things you can do that you don't know what you want to do. And you don't want to work a boring nine to five because there's all these people figuring out how to make money on online without doing that. So I think that's part of the problem too, is the paradox of choice. There's too many things you can do. So you don't know what to do or what to study. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it is a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I don't know. I don't want to go back to only having grape jelly and apple jelly, you know, (laughs) right, right. There's so many amazing things out there in the world. I just go to farmer's markets and you can get any kind of jelly, any kind of, there's a honey stand over here that has like 50 different kinds of honey. I didn't even know that was possible, but I love it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So it's hard to think about going backwards, but indeed the paradox of choice is it's very the irony of our contemporary <laughs> lives, I think, in many ways. Yeah. Well, Zavia, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your book, the inspiration for it, where our audience can go find it. Uh, how did you come up with the, the concept and what was your inspiration behind writing this book? Well, it's um, a kind of a long story, but I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> Um, writing a book is always a long story, at least for me anyway, it takes a while. Um, but this is a book about the Houston photography scene. So it's called Making a Scene, uh, how visionary individuals created an international photography scene in Houston, Texas. If you aren't into photography, Houston, Texas may not be what you think of as an art world, but um, indeed, this is where you want to come if you're interested in opportunities and support for photography. So I, um, you know, was kind of a new kid looking around for something interesting in the city, and I'd always been interested in photography, and eventually it was kind of like, well, let's see, let's check this this out, and I was amazed um, at what was happening. I um, got very involved and swept up in it, and then I realized that you know, these things don't just happen. People actually created this scene. And the people who created it were getting ready to retire. And I thought, oh my gosh, now is the time to um, document this. Mm -hmm. And as a sociologist, of course, I was interested in the scene, the community that they built. Um, And so I thought of this book as kind of a community project, like a gift to the community that both documents what people did, but also demonstrates what committed, passionate individuals can do to make a difference in their community and beyond. And I say beyond because this is an international community now, or scene, shall I say. And so that was kind of what captivated me and made me spend all these years writing this book. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm really glad to have it out. It's a fantastic kind of Texas style story of, Mm -hmm. you know, audacious ideas meet um, the pavement here in Houston. And so I was really happy to be the one that got to tell the story and have it out in the world now. So it's available from the publisher, Schilt Publishing. I'll give you the link. You can put it in the show notes. Um, And then It'll be on Amazon in January. So that's okay. Awesome. Time, awesome. It's not, it's a, not officially released in the U S until January. So you're, you're getting a preview sneak peek. Preview. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, exciting. You're right on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's always fun getting access to it before it's really released to the public and you get to, you know, say that you read it before other people did and that kind of thing. So yeah, you're in the know. Very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> and we talked about that. I know before as well as just the, the world is now a global place. So really anything that you do locally with the click of a button, you can be distributing it and putting it on a live video or a YouTube video that has watched all around the world. So I know that you mentioned that really it's it's now more of a global movement, even though it was a local scene that had been uh, taking place. Well, and actually this, my story or the community started in the mid seventies when all of the things you're talking about didn't, they weren't even on the radar yet. <laughs> right. So they didn't have those avenues to kind of bring the world to Houston. But a number of the kind of important people really wanted to bring international photography to Houston and help Houston photographers 
reach an international audience. Mm -hmm. So they really had that focus of trying to internationalize clear back in the 70s and 80s when they started. So there's three primary organizations. There's Ann Tucker, who was the founding curator of photography at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, built a premier collection. There is a member-run organization, Houston Center for Photography, that um, is a member-run organization. So it really helped build skill levels locally. So they did lots of workshops and Mm -hmm. meetings, as well as exhibitions. And then PhotoFest, which is an international photography festival. And it was the absolute first one in the United States. And it was the largest for most of its years. There's a few more that are rivaling for size. But one of the things that PhotoFest founders, Wendy Watrous and Fred Baldwin did is 1990, they had gathered a group of other festival owners, festival directors, excuse me, Mm -hmm. around the world to learn how to use email. (laughs) Isn't that, it's so hard to imagine. That is amazing, yeah. Yes, and they worked with Kodak one year and had photographers send in images to Kodak. Kodak would scan the photos and put them on a disc that you could watch, which was like revolutionary. (laughs) So it's kind of fun to look back and see things that we take for granted. Yeah. And how they actually got kind of uh, translated into the photography world, the technology. Well, absolutely. Kind of I mean, even I have, yeah. I've got a nice camera that I'll take on trips and, you know, it's, it's a little mirrorless one that collapses and it can fit in your pocket. But then I went on a trip recently and I just said, you know, I'm not even going to take that because my phone, the quality is so great on my phone these days that mm-hmm. we can still, again, in that global world that we live in, we can snap a photo and you can send a 1080p photograph across the world or put it on Instagram or share it on Facebook. And mm-hmm. not to diminish the work of, you know, photography obviously is an art form and just being able to take those photos and have the right lighting that I'm not saying that a phone can replace that at all, but I love how technology has come so far from having dial up internet and not being able to make a phone call and use the internet at the same time. Cause I do remember growing up through that where I wanted to play computer games and my parents couldn't use the phone, right? <laughs> they just heard uh-huh. the noises in the background. So it's amazing to see how far technology has come and I can't imagine how far it's going to go in the next 10 or 20 years. I know that's the really interesting thing is so I've kind of captured the first 40 years of how they built this scene yeah. and developed these organizations. But now what, you know, it's really interesting because it's, you know, COVID, everybody went kind of on hiatus and tried yeah. to refigure out. Um, but now we're back and um, all three of the organizations now have new leaders. So all the founders have retired for the most part. Um, There are new people in place and um, Houston Center for Photography has just hired a new director that'll be here in January. So awesome. It's all, you know, who knows? Right. Everything's up in the air. There's there's new people, new initiatives, I'm sure, new ideas and just different perspectives that are going to come. So it's really kind of interesting to see what that will be, what the new, you know, the next iteration of all of this. Absolutely. After after tracing the last 40 years, you see what happened. Yeah, Um, and so much happens. I think I remember hearing a stat about the amount of content that is uploaded to YouTube. It's something unfathomable where there's just billions or hundreds of millions of hours that are just uploaded of content. I can't remember the frequency daily or monthly, but we it's no surprise that so much content is being uploaded and created across the world. And the amount of people that are online and have access to the internet, I'm sure it's only going to compound even more. So it'll be exciting again to see just where where will photography be? Where, are we going to be looking through a virtual reality headset and be walking through a museum and seeing photos in, in virtual reality? I'm not sure what the what the future holds, but it's exciting nonetheless. It is, it is. And I, you know, as an educator, I hope some of these wonderful things actually make it to the classroom. Um, I just came back from Venice. I like to go to the Biennale there every two years. Mm -hmm. And they had one exhibition, um, I'm forgetting which pavilion it was in, that was all um, virtual. I mean, you put the headset on and you sat in the thing and this whole thing played out around (laughs) you. 360 degrees and I thought what an amazing way to bring information to the classroom 
Yeah. So, I don't know. It'll take a while before we can afford that kind of technology in the classroom. But yeah, it's, it's, it's very impressive amazing. to see what can happen. But even though there's a lot of technological changes, I know we had talked about community and those commonalities when you're building a community, right? Having some kind of leadership and like being uh, very outgoing and attracting people to you. That's a very powerful concept because no matter what happens and no matter what the technology looks like, I believe those are still going to be very core important factors in making sure you can actually build communities, whether they're online or in virtual reality or you know even in person as old school as that may be i think no one can really replace sitting around a campfire and having real face-to-face connections absolutely right chris i think a lot of as i trace the history a lot of the kind of synchronicity happened because people were at the same event yes you know, drinking wine and you know talking about their dreams and visions and mm-hmm. and that's where connections are made is when you're actually you know, in the proximity of each other. So I did, as I'm tracing this, I did look at the sociology literature on scene building, Mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting because I didn't even know there was such a literature until (laughs) I started thinking about it. Um, And there are several things that the literature says you need um, to call yourself a scene. So one of them is you need some sort of geographic place where people can meet. You need a shared passion, a shared interest. So in this case, it was photography. People who wanted to be photographers, people who wanted to collect photography, people that just wanted to have a good time. Around Mm -hmm. photography, it was all kinds of of things, but photography was the core, visual images. And then you have to have visionary individuals that can demonstrate why you want to do this and make it sound exciting. So for example, with um, Ann Tucker at the museum, she was able to show that photography can say something, it can be important, it can be valued as art. She had an educational kind of uh, first few years because in Houston, people had really arrived at the idea that photography could be art. Right. Um, The HCP, they would bring important photographers in to give classes, you could learn and this and that. And and Wendy and Fred were traveling all over the globe, finding exciting photography to bring to Houston Um, because there just wasn't the global world that we have now. So it was exciting to think about this new thing, photography. It was new, it was fascinating. There was so much that hadn't been done. So it seemed meaningful to kind of get on board with this vision and help build these organizations and institutions. So those are kind of the the three pillars, if you will, of a scene from the literature is the leadership with the vision that makes it meaningful and something you want to be a part of, um, a shared interest, and then a place where you all can kind of gather. Absolutely. That's powerful. And I know there's a lot of crossover between that and just even leadership within organizations or for entrepreneurs. That has a lot of overlap with some of the business coaching that I've sat in and the conferences that I've been to where, hey, how do you get people to do stuff? How do you get them to work towards a vision and get excited and paint that picture of building a Disney World type of place when you're just getting started and have a two-man operation or two-woman operation, right? Like, how do you actually inspire others to see that vision when you're like, I don't, we're not going to be yeah. Disney World. Like, we're just renting a little space here at, you know, WeWork or something like that, right? <laughs> so it takes some time to be able to step into that and allow others to see that same vision, work towards that with you and having faith yeah. in that process that you're the right leader to get them there and that you can actually bridge the gap from reality to the vision that you're painting for your people. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I do see a lot of generalizations. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that's why I was so excited to have this conversation because I'm I'm always learning and applying how does that building a scene in Houston, for example, for the photograph community or photo community, how does that overlap to what I'm trying to do with building a community of like-minded individuals who want to get better and you know expand their businesses and maybe grow a podcast or whatever it is that we're trying to do in the world. We're trying to make our place and we love getting around people who love what we love and we can break bread with and have similar conversations and challenge each other. 
So that there's a lot of uh, lessons there for everyone, regardless of their occupation or their focus in uh, entrepreneurship or, or business. Right. Well, I think there's one other thing that came out of, of my research that might be um, helpful in that vein. And that's the idea that um, Houstonians seem to really like Houston, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so if you're fundraising in Houston, if you can talk about how your vision builds Houston to be bigger and better, you're more likely to have people come together and join and support you. Yes. Um, and for nonprofit art organizations, you, it's the money they're looking for, but you would be mm -hmm. looking for clients, et cetera, and other industries. Right. But it's really, how do you tap into what your market is gonna be interested in, in a way, yeah. and what your community, what your potential supporters. So for Houston, it's, you know, making the city bigger and better and showing off, showing Absolutely. off a little bit, that Texan bigger and better sort of idea. It's very prominent. That makes a lot of sense. And people love to support the causes that they believe in. And they have that sense of community like, oh, I was born there. I grew up there. Or, you know, that sports team, I watched the World Series game. You know, you see that affection from people who who love that place and are associating memories and good times and growing up in the house that they lived in with that, you know, that city that can be very powerful, whether it's Houston or any other city, as I know, you know, we've got a global audience, even people living outside the U S that listen to the show, but um, yeah. that's very powerful. If you can tie into that and right. you automatically have a bond when you meet someone who's from your city, you're just like, Oh my gosh, I lived here. And you can speak to the neighborhood and <laughs> that bar right there. We used to go there all the time, right? You build instant rapport. So I always enjoy uh, just talking about those things with other people who have lived, you know, in or near where I've lived or grown up. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But I think different cities have different marks for fundraising yeah. or, or building, you know, and so the, the hometown is one and universities play on that. If you've oh, ever yes. gotten a call from, you know, the alumni center you know, <laughs> trying to pitch you, you went to school here, you should give us money. Um, but other cities have different things that they're yeah. proud of, you know, and so it's a matter of trying to figure out how your vision fits in with the milieu you're kind of working in, I think. Yeah. Well, so many powerful lessons that we have discussed. Is there a main takeaway that you would like to share with the audience before we let them know where we, they can find you? Or um, is there any like lesson that they should go implement in terms of building a society? I'm just curious to hear if you were to tie it all up in a nice bow, what would that last oh. punchline be? Okay, I don't know if it's a bow or a punchline, but I, I just think it's a wonderful story that shows how you can make a difference. You know, so anybody who wants to have a role model and, and see how other people made a difference, made their mark, made something that the community and the entire international photography scene is going to cherish for years. So it's more of that. It's a wonderful story of what you could do, what an individual can do with vision, passion, and consistency. That's very inspiring because I know a lot of times we think, who am I to accomplish all these big goals and dreams, or I'm not you know, fill in the blank of someone that we all look up to, but those people were just normal people like us and they had a big vision, big dreams, big goals, and they just took big action consistently to get to where they are. And so I think that's a huge takeaway is that yeah. any of us can make our big visions and goals and dreams true with enough passion and consistency over time. Just don't give up. <laughs> Never give up. That's always my mantra as well. Well, Zavia, I really enjoyed our conversation. Where's the best place to send people to your personal website, the book link? I'll make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Okay. That'd be great. So my personal website is Tracy Zavia Karner. So T-R-A-C-Y-X-A-V-I-A-K-A-R-N-E-R.com. Um, and so that's my personal, but I think I'm also the only Zavia in Texas, uh, <laughs> definitely in Houston. So if you just Google Zavia with an X, it sounds like a Z, X-A-V-I-A um, in Houston, you will find me. Awesome. So, but I look forward if people read, and I, lo I love to hear comments from people who have read the book. Yes. For anyone reading the book, make sure to leave feedback. That's always very helpful. Just to understand what resonated. Do you have questions on anything? And then just seeing where people are coming from and you know, different backgrounds. That's, I think that's always curious. Who are my listeners? 
are, are they even entrepreneurs? Do they have a day job? Like, it's very interesting to hear yeah. why are they listening? What resonated the most? So those listening, make sure to read Zavia's book and be sure to provide her with some honest feedback as I know that's always helpful just to understand what people- uh, I would appreciate about. it. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> And tell your friends. <laughs> and tell your friends. That's important too. As entrepreneurs and best-selling authors, right? That's like, they always talk about best-selling authors. You got to go out there and sell it and pitch it right. and talk to people. Yeah. And yeah. the best referrals are always word of mouth, even for myself in the real estate business. My right. best deals, my best clients are always referrals, which word of mouth is very powerful. So mm-hmm. Zavia, thank you once again for your time. I really enjoyed our conversation and I know our audience did as well. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.